Testing. Whoa, there we go. Good morning. Or as they say in Italy, buongiorno. I just got back from leading a Rome pilgrimage last month. It was wonderful to be on pilgrimage again. It's wonderful to be doing big conferences like this, is, this again. Uh, this is the 19th Ignited by Truth conference. This is amazing. Yeah, let's give it up to all the organizers who have blessed so many people throughout the years. I, I've met a number of you already at the hotel last night, people here this morning, and, uh, and, and so many people over the last almost 20 years have been so blessed by this conference. So we're so grateful for all the hard work that lay people taking initiative to offer a great event like this is really amazing. So I want to encourage you, do all you can to support this effort. Uh, I know that there's many other dioceses around the country that have conferences like this, uh, and it's always an incredible blessing. So please support uh, the effort of, of, of Ignited by Truth, especially as they get ready to celebrate 20 years next year. So today, in this session, I'm so excited. I'm going to share with you a little bit about uh, a, a book that I wrote that just came out this past year. Uh, the book is called The Art of Living, and I want to talk about that uh, here with you this morning. But to start off, I want to ask, are there any people that play music out here? Any, any, you play the piano, you play the violin, you play the flute, something like that. I want to tell you about one of my sons who's a, a very gifted in music. So all of our kids do some musical instrument. We have a harpist, we have a pianist, we have a, a violinist, we have a celloist. So we, it's beautiful music in the three household many times. Um, but one of my kids is particularly gifted. I want to tell you about him. Uh, when he was two years old, he would come home from church as like a two and a half year old and he'd hear the song at mass and he would go to the piano and figure it out. He would just go to the piano and go do 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 You know, here was this woman who had entered into this wonderful tradition of piano playing and, and she mastered it. She actually did her masters out here at, at, at UNC many, many years ago. Uh, and she became a master a writer, she composed music and a master teacher. And she was someone who stepped into this great tradition of piano playing and was passing it on to my son. And so within about 18 months, my son starts doing some piano competitions. And he'd never done that before. And he starts placing, you know, little local things. And this and a nine-year-old and wins state. Uh, and he gets to go play with a symphony orchestra in Breckenridge. Uh, and, and so, and he just keeps going on and on and developing as a piano player. Now, why am I telling you about my son's piano playing? It's because there's a certain challenge we're facing in our culture today. And I want to use an analogy here. I want you to imagine, imagine you were like my son. You were someone that wanted to learn how to play the piano. And you were so excited. And you wanted to learn and you told your parents, I want, I want to play the piano. I want to get really good at piano. And, and, and your, your parents, imagine if your parents said to you, oh, Johnny, that's really nice. That's awesome. We, we, we affirm that desire. You know what we're going to do? We're going to buy you a piano. We're going to put it in this room over here. And then, Johnny, you go in that room and you figure out how to play the piano all on your own. It's going to be amazing. You, you can go in the room and spend as much time as you want and you figure out piano playing all by yourself. We believe in you and, 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 and you're special, Johnny, and, and, and you could be your own piano player. We believe in you. Yes, we want you to be your own piano player. Go for it, Johnny. How far do you think Johnny's going to get in his piano playing? Imagine if, you know, he goes to school and his music teacher hears about all this. And the music teacher and the education, the principal, all the educators at the school are like, Oh, Johnny, we heard about your piano playing. That's awesome. You're special, Johnny. We're so excited that you express yourself this way, that you can be your own piano player. You can figure out piano all by yourself. You know, and then the mayor of the town hears about this. Young man, Johnny, I heard you're trying to play the piano piano and be your own piano player. That's amazing. We're going to give you a nice medal. We'll give you a trophy. It'll be awesome. You're amazing, Johnny. You can do anything you want, Johnny. Now, imagine Johnny goes off to college and he wants to take some music classes and he meets peers his age that are playing the piano. Peers that are like my kid, my son. And he hears them play this Mozart piano concerto. And Johnny's going to be like, whoa, 
I've never heard the piano play like that. Because Johnny, you know, playing by himself, he figured out Twinkle Twinkle and Yankee Doodle and, you know, he, you know, he, he can play some things. But he's never heard the piano played like that before. And he's in awe and he asks them, whoa, what is that? And, and they say, oh, it's a Mozart piano concerto. And then Johnny comes... Because that's, that's not a what, it's a who. He was a composer. He, he wrote this song. And, and he's like, you mean there were people that wrote music? No one ever told me that. My parents didn't tell me that. My school system never taught me that. My, my society, around me, my community, the, the culture didn't teach me that. I mean, there's people that wrote music. They figured this out. Yeah, you don't know about Mozart and Bach and Beethoven and Chopin and Rachmaninoff. You've never heard of these people? No, I've never heard of these people. Huh? How, how, how did you hear about them? Well, our, our piano teachers taught us this. Piano teachers? You mean there's teachers out there that teach you how to play the piano? All these years, I've been trying to just figure it out on my own. W wow, that's amazing. How did you find the piano teacher? Well, yeah, our parents g gave us piano teachers, and, and they shared with us about these composers, and, and they you know, it taught us how to, to read their music. And Johnny's like, what do you mean, read their music? What are you talking about? Oh, yeah, don't you know that there's music? Yeah, here, let me show you. Here's, here, this is what Mozart wrote. It's all right here. These are all the notes. And Johnny's looking at, at this music, and for him, it's just a bunch of lines with dots. It's like a foreign language. He has no idea what this is. And, 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 and they're like, you know, yeah, every, every, you know, every little dot on that line represents a note on one of the keys. And Johnny never knew about music, that there was sheet music that you can read from to learn all this. And Johnny's like, why didn't anyone tell me this? Imagine you're Johnny. How would you feel? Would you be frustrated? You've been spending all these years, you desire to play the piano well, and no one ever told you about this great tradition of piano playing. No one ever taught you about the great teachers. No one ever taught you about how to make a beautiful sound with the piano. You never got that great tradition. How would you feel? You'd feel cheated, wouldn't you? That's the word. When I give this presentation to young adults, to young college students, young professionals in their 20s and 30s, young married couples, young parents, the word that they use is cheated. Cheated. And I share this with you because as I speak, in my work with Focus, I'm so blessed to work with tens of thousands of college students around the country. I'm blessed to work with a thousand young people in their 20s that are amazing missionaries. And I do work outside of Focus, just meeting young professionals, young couples. My wife and I do a lot of work in marriage and family. Uh, and, and we do mentoring. We do a lot of writing and speaking on this topic. So we, we meet a lot of this younger generation. And that's how they feel about life. See, when I show up on a college campus and I give a talk on theology of the body, I have so many young people that will come up and say, why didn't anyone tell me this before? I've just been taking in what the culture has been teaching me about love and dating and the hookup culture and, uh, and sex and, and open-ended relationships and it's painful. It doesn't work I, and, and I hate it. I, didn't, I had no idea there was another way to do this. Why didn't anyone tell me this before? There's a better way to do dating. How many young couples, my wife and I were just meeting with a, a young couple the other week. Uh, they were mentoring back in Denver. and. And, you know, the, so many young people are, are looking desperately for models for marriage. They, they, maybe they came from broken homes, so they, don't, they, they often tell me, I, I don't have a model for what that looks like. Or maybe they, their marriage, their parents stayed intact, but it wasn't a healthy, thriving marriage. There was a lot of dysfunction, a lot of hurt, a lot of guilt trips, and it just, it just was, it doesn't something that they can hold up as a model. And so they're desperately looking for any advice they can give. How do, how do you build a good marriage? How do we do engagement right? How, how do we start our, the, the begin years of the marriage? I, I hear from many uh, young parents as they're trying to raise kids. Okay, how do we do this parenting thing? And then they hear principles from the Catholic Church about how to, do, how to do parenting well that aren't well known. They're not often talked about. You rarely hear them in a homily, but there's wonderful principles from the saints, from our Catholic tradition, and nobody talks about it. And when we just share some basic things, they're like, whoa, why didn't anyone tell us this before? I would have done parenting differently. I would have been a better dad. I would have been a better mom. What I'm sharing with you, my friends, is something that Pope Benedict wrote about a number of years ago. He talked about how the crisis we're facing today 
isn't merely a crisis of faith. He writes a lot about that as well. There is a crisis of faith. People don't know the Bible anymore or they reject it. They don't know the catechism. They don't know the basics of our faith. That's a tragedy. But Pope Benedict wisely understands that the problem actually is even worse than that. I mean, that's really bad. But the problem is that we, as we've turned away from the gospel, we've turned away from tradition, we've lost the basics of human values. He says, we don't even know how to live. We don't know how to live friendship. We don't know how to live in community with other young people today. Like they're so scared if there's conflict. Oh, there's conflict. I don't know how to deal with conflict. I, I just got to avoid my boss or I got to avoid the people around me. I'm going to end this relationship. I'll just start ghosting someone. This happens all the time with young people. I, I, I don't want to be in this dating relationship anymore. So I just won't return her texts anymore. I won't return her calls anymore. I just ghost her. That's how young people deal with conflict. They don't know the basics of just how to live in community. We don't know the basics how to build marriage. We don't know the basics anymore of, uh, of how to, to build a, a, a strong family life anymore. My goodness, in our culture, we don't know the, we don't even get bathrooms right. We don't know the basics of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. We have turned away We've turned away from what Pope, Pope Benedict calls the art of living. It's not just that we don't know the faith and apologetics. We don't know how to live. We have lost the art of living, he says. And he says that the center of the new evangelization must be passing on the art of living again. Teaching people the basics of how to live life. Decision making, attitude, or courage, the ability to press against difficult things, to, to face difficulties well, temper and self-control. And then justice, so I live my life always fulfilling my responsibilities to God and to the people in my life. These were just the basic ABCs that were passed on from generation to generation, from father to son, from uncle to nephew, from master to apprentice, from pastor to his people. This is, just, and it's not really complicated stuff. It was just like the basic ABCs, but we don't even know this anymore. The average Catholic. Sadly, even the average Catholic couldn't name the four cardinal virtues. And if you happen to be one of the people in the 90th percentile, you know the four cardinal virtues. Don't pat yourself on the back just yet, because do you know what are the three steps of prudence? To, if you want to be a prudent person, do you know those three steps? This is just the basics, going back to Aristotle, Aquinas, and others. Do you know what are the, the, the four or five core virtues you need to be a courageous man? Do you know about the various vices that undermine? I mean, again, this is the basic ABC stuff that was passed on. And today, we, we go and, and we, we train young people to learn how to build rockets and build airplanes and build bridges, but we don't teach them how to build the most basic, the most human. I want to share with you today the great tradition of the art of living. Are you ready? Let's begin with asking Mary to pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. The Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Does anyone like flying? Okay, I need my image on the screen. We need images on the screen here for the people in the back. There we go. Anyone like flying? All right. So as a little kid, I used to go on trips with my dad sometimes, and I just loved flying. I loved being at 38,000 feet. It was amazing. And, uh, and being above the clouds, and, and, and it's cloudy down below and rain, but sunny up here. I mean, I'm just so fascinated as a kid. To this day, I still, I do a lot of flying, and I like it. It's actually kind of fun. And if I, if I heard that you needed to fly somewhere, you needed to fly to Los Angeles, and I heard that. Imagine if I came to you and said, oh, I love flying. I get excited about filing, flying. I have strong feelings about flying. I'll fly you to LA. Would you get in, in the airplane with me in the cockpit? No way. I'm not that kind of, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have the skills of a pilot, right? Same thing. My dad was a, a surgeon. And I grew up meeting his patients at the hospital, looking at pictures of his surgeries. I was kind of weird. I would look at anatomy books as a kid growing up. And I was fascinated by, by surgery. And to this day, I hold surgeons in high esteem. But let's say I heard you needed surgery. I said, oh, I love surgery. 
I value surgery. I, I get strong feelings and excitement about surgery. Here, you get on table here, I'll perform your surgery. Would you get on the operating table with me as your surgeon? No way. I'm not that kind of a doctor. <laughs> Again, this is basics, right? I mean, this is you know, common sense. No one would ever jump a a into an airplane with somebody that doesn't have the skills of a pilot. And no one would ever jump onto the operating table with someone that doesn't have the skills of a surgeon. And yet, how many people today jump into friendships business partnerships, dating relationships, marriage, without ever asking the question of virtue. Does this person have the ability to love me, the skill to love me? So I'm going to give you a fuller definition of virtue later, but, but first, I just want to think of virtue as a skill. Like the skill of surgery, there's a skill for that, there's a skill for flying a plane, there's a skill for being a good friend, there's a skill for being a good husband. And there's a great skill for being a good dad. And that's called virtue. Okay, so I want, what I want to share with you here is the idea that think of virtue as a skill. You need a skill to love. Think of virtue as the basic skills we need to love people. If I'm going to love the people in my life, my wife, my kids, my friends, by God, I need more than feelings. I need more than I value God and I value my wife. Uh, how many of you are married here? Raise your hands, married folks. How many of you value your spouse? Keep your hands up, okay. <laughs> How many of you have done something to hurt your spouse? Right, so you can value your spouse and still not live according to your value. You need virtue. How many of you value God? You're here this weekend because you value God. How many of you put yourself before God sometimes? You don't spend enough time to pray with Him. You don't follow His will, right? Like in other words, we value God. We value the people in our lives, but we don't live according to those values. We need virtue. Virtue is what enables us to give ourselves as a gift to others and to love. As a kid, I used to think of virtue in a more individualistic way, like it was for me, my personal self-improvement plan. You know, so I can be better. I want to be better. I want to improve. I want to be a better version of myself. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to grow in virtue. I remember hearing about this, you know, fortitude and piety and fear of the Lord and temperance. You heard about all these virtues. They were kind of like badges. You know, like, I'm going to earn a badge. I got the fortitude badge now. You know, I want to be a good boy scout for Jesus. I'm going to earn that badge. But it's more about me. But over time, I've come to see virtue isn't about me primarily. I need virtue, yes, but my wife needs me to be virtuous. <laughs> my kids need me to be virtuous. The people in my office are depending on me to be virtuous. And to the extent I'm growing in virtue, to the extent I'm generous and patient and courageous and prudent, I can do generous, courageous, patient, and prudent things to bless the people around me. But to the extent I fall short in generosity, that's not just an Edward Sree problem. Oh, I'm falling short, I gotta be better. No, that's a problem for my wife. When I fall short in generosity, when I, when I lack generosity, I will do selfish things that hurt Beth. I don't wanna hurt Beth, I love Beth. But I know that I, I, my, my love for her is tainted by my lack of virtue, that I need to grow in more generosity, to get out of myself, to think about her, to think about things from her perspective more. I, I need to grow in generosity so I can be a better husband. Similarly, like when I struggle with patience, that's not just an Edward Street issue. That's a problem for my kids. When I'm impatient, there's stressful situations, I kind of lose it and I, I lose my temper, I raise my voice, I, I hurt them. I don't want to hurt my kids. I love my kids. But I know that my love for them is tainted by my own impatience sometimes. I got to get better at this. Courage. I, I, I need to be a more courageous person. Not just for me, but for the people in my office, for example. You know, if management comes and says, hey, there's this big project we want to give you all. And I'm like, oh, whoa, whoa I don't, our, our plates are full. And I, 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 this is going to be overwhelming. And it's a tight deadline. I don't know how I'm going to get this done. If I lack courage, I'm going to do one of two things. I'm going to just feel crushed and overwhelmed. Oh, I'm going to be discouraged. I lose my courage and I'm overwhelmed. And it's just going to be hard and I just cower. Or I become a whiner. I become like Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh. Oh, it's just hard being this department and management doesn't understand. I just become a whiner. That's not helpful. My teammates need me to be a courageous leader. All right, Je All right guys, this is going to be hard. I I'm not sure how we're going to get this done, but I believe in this team.
I believe we can figure it out. We can prioritize. We're going to do this. They need me to be courageous. When I lack courage, it hurts them. When I lack prudence and I'm not thinking through the budget and I just spend some money, my wife's like, honey, we needed that for this other thing. Or I, I fill up on a social calendar and she's like, honey, I needed time to just go to Costco this weekend and we're having all these people. How am I going to do this? When I lack prudence, wise decision making, it affects the people around me. See, virtue gives me the freedom to love. The more I grow in virtue, the more I'm able to love the people around me. The, the more that I'm not thinking about virtue, I'm not trying to grow in virtue, the more I end up hurting the people around me, not being the man that God needs me to be for them. There we go. Awesome. Okay. There we go. Virtue is an habitual and firm disposition to do the good. But what I really want to look at is the next slide where I start walking through four characteristics of virtue. Oh, we are awesome. This is awesome. Okay. So I want, these are the four key things you need. First of all, consistency. Are you consistent? It's more than just doing the good every once in a while. Do you do the good consistently? So if you volunteered at church this last week to help set up the chairs, that's awesome. But that doesn't earn you the Christian Service Award. Maybe that's the first time you volunteered in the last five years. <laughs> you know, so it, just doing it once doesn't mean you're, you're so virtuous. It's, it's consistent. It's also, it's easy for you. In other words, it's, it's just a part of who you are. You're the kind of person that volunteers. When Father needs help, you're just there. You just want to help. It's not like, oh, Father asks for volunteers, and you're like... I hope he doesn't choose me, <laughs> you know, uh, or and you do it promptly. You're not like, well, maybe, oh, I don't know. I've got a lot to do, and, uh, but I should. But no, no, it's just kind of, again, it's part of who you are. You just, you do it promptly and you do it joyfully.